brief introduction, um, plan review at DOB for demolition plans. Uh, it's performed by Construction Safety Compliance Plan Exam Group, uh, formerly BEST. Uh, we review plan submissions uh, for all full demolition, DM filings, uh, site safety plans, uh, cocoon and climbing formwork plans, where the systems are proposed in lieu of code mandated safety netting, and we review construction code determinations uh, related to uh, construction safety, Chapter 33. Uh, site safety plan examination team is responsible for a prior to permit review and approval full demolition means and methods plans. Uh, these plans are reviewed for code compliance and some other requirements. Uh, what are these requirements? We're going to get into that a little bit here. Um, get some code references and definitions. Uh, generally, these are the areas where you're going to find your requirements for uh, demolition plan submittal. Uh, a little bit from the administrative code under construction documents. And then largely these, these requirements are found in chapter 33 of the building code, which is safeguards during construction or demolition, and specifically under chapter 3306, um, the, the demolition section. There are a couple other pertinent industry notices. Uh, one is uh, minimum content of demolition plan submissions, which um, was issued to kind of flesh out some of the plan requirements that maybe weren't specified in the code, but um, really were um, things that needed to be included that were maybe just kind of implied by the code. And there's another one for waivers of um, foundation and slab removal or waivers of backfill um, that we'll get into a little bit later. Um, when we talk about when are demolition plans required, that's outlined in 3306.5, and there are some, some exceptions to these requirements. Uh, the first exception is if there's uh, emergency work pursuant to uh, 28215.1 of the administrative code. So that section says, uh, notwithstanding any other provisions of the law, if the commissioner determines that a structure or premises or any part thereof poses an imminent danger, serious physical injury of death to the public, or is an imminent danger of collapse. Um, basically, the commissioner can designate this emergency work, and this is something that is immediately hazardous, has to start right away. Plan submittal requirement um, does not apply here. Uh, and the other, the other areas are for three-story buildings, or buildings that are three stories or fewer in height, and no mechanical demolition equipment is used. Uh, so a detached one, two, or three family dwelling, both halves of a semi-detached one, two, or three family dwelling, or a detached accessory use to a one, two, or three family dwelling. Um, uh, item three, removal of foundations and landscaping elements accessory to the to a one, two, or three family dwelling, or number, and number four, uh, Full demo of a building that's fully detached, three stories or fewer, with a floor area less than 5,000 square feet or less per story, and you don't use any mechanical demolition equipment. So those are the exceptions. Uh, everything else requires a demo plan. Uh, now, I want to clarify that this presentation is specific to full demolition, DM filings, and DM plan submission. Uh, these are some definitions from uh, 3302. Uh, full demolition is you know, dismantling, raising, or removal of all of a building or structure, including all operations incidental thereto. Uh, then the code talks about equipment. Uh, there's a distinction between handheld devices and mechanical demolition equipment. Uh, and we'll get into those those differences later, but a mechanical demolition equipment is mechanically driven or powered. Um, it's a machine like a bobcat, a skid steer, um, excavator. Uh, handheld equipment is something that you can uh, pick up and hold like a 
uh, like a saw or a chipping gun or a chipping hammer. Uh, another definition that, that might apply is a major building. Uh, it's an existing building in this case that would be 10 or more stories, 125 feet in height. Uh, there are special requirements when you demolish a, a major building. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, talk about debris and removal of debris with the demolition. Uh, debris netting may apply if the building is seven stories or more. Uh, in that case, safety netting systems, something we'll discuss. So debris or structural nets installed vertically or horizontally, along with all supports, components, and connections. That and horizontal safety netting, vertical safety netting, structural net, those all apply, those all come from uh, 3308, the uh, protection of unenclosed perimeters, which doesn't apply in, in every demo situation, but we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, scaffolds. Uh, these are temporary work platforms, sometimes used for um, protection systems. And when we're talking about scaffolds with demolition, we're, we're talking about supported scaffolds. Uh, and this equipment is classified as temporary construction equipment. Uh, unenclosed perimeters, we'll get into that more when we talk about uh, Chapter 3308. And same thing with the uh, working deck. Okay, so the difference when we talk about equipment, mechanical demolition equipment, uh, this is an example of mechanically driven or powered equipment util utilized to physically demolish a building or structure or elements of a building or structure, um, whether it's placed inside or outside, it doesn't matter. This is, um, this is mechanical demo equipment, a high reach, this sort of uh, Track equipment with a hammer attachment. Um, this is mechanical equipment. This is important when we get into um, start talking about the demolition safety zone because it's uh, specific to demolition performed with this type of equipment. Um, here's an example of handheld devices, um, chipping guns, things like this. Oh. Um, one important note from the definition of a handheld device, it comes at the very last line of this definition, that a handheld device does not include remote controlled equipment. Um, so if you're using a Brock, some sort of uh, demolition robot, uh, mechanically or remote control operated, that is uh, also mechanical equipment. Okay, and before I guess one, one section before we get into the actual uh, preparation of the plans, um, we're going to talk a little bit about planning and the types of you know, research and work that has to be done prior to um, prior to putting together the actual plan set. Um, so this, there's like a, a preparation phase. Uh, to every every demolition where uh, the work has to be done to kind of identify or establish what what the existing structure is. Um, you might need a detailed appraisal by means of surveys and appropriate assessments um, performed, um, structural survey and photographs, um, and then once you've established the structure, then you can go ahead and start preparing for um, the demolition you know, means and methods. But, but prior to all that, there has to be this sort of um, research and assessment of not just the building to be demolished, but also um, the adjoining structures. So assessment of building to be demolished, um, things you, you want to provide or things you want to look out for, you want to get gather all the information you can on uh, any structures that might require special attention, such as cantilevered structures, uh, pre-stressed concrete, 
precast concrete, steel composite structures, cladding walls, stressed skin structures, hanging structures, et cetera. Um, and an assessment should be performed by or under the direction of the registered design professional who prepares the submittal documents. So this assessment should consist of an interior and exterior physical inspection of the structure, uh, as well as a review of all pertinent plans and records of the structure. So uh, I, would, I would refer you to um, Tim Lynch's presentation from Monday about knowing your neighbors and uh, assessing not just the building to be demolished, but the uh, adjoining structure. But I think if you know if you know the age of your building, you know when it was constructed, and you're familiar with the typology, um, you can, you know, you can identify um, the construction type. You know how it was built, um, and then you can, you know, look for things like failing, rotting floors, kitchen and bathroom areas, partially collapsed floors, uh, roofs, chimneys, buckled walls. Um, Going to be looking for roofs stripped of uh, membrane for asbestos debatement. Um, these are all things like you need to establish what the existing structure is, and it's going to require some uh, some work on the part of the applicant. Uh, to that point, you're going to you're going to look out for um, weakened structures. Uh, Thirty three hundred six point seven deals with demolition of weakened structures. Uh, so where a structure to be demolished has been partially wrecked or weakened by fire, flood, explosion, age, other causes, uh, it needs to be shored, embraced, or braced to the extent necessary to permit uh, orderly full demolition uh, without collapse. Um, so these necessary measures shall be determined by the design professional or the AOR and shall be approved uh, by the commissioner. Uh, and there are a couple exceptions to that. Um, if you're doing the build, uh, the demolition uh, with mechanical demolition equipment uh, from outside the building. Um, maybe there's an emergency declaration uh, for this site. Uh, in the event that uh, the forensic engineering unit has issued your site uh, an emergency declaration, uh, there's a lot of helpful information about the structure already included in the in the body of the emergency deck. Um, it, it still surprises me how many times we receive uh, plans for demolition of a building that are inconsistent with the information that was provided uh, to the applicant, to the owner in the emergency declaration. So this is an example, emergency deck issued uh, they described partial floor collapse with surrounding floor uh, severe, severely deteriorated and at risk of further collapse. Um, yeah, it's it, it happens often that we receive plans that are not consistent with information that was provided uh, by by DOB. Um, but we're looking for uh, a statement on the cover sheet of the plans. Every DM set whether it's weakened or not, they have to tell us um, whether the building is weakened, that they did an assessment, they have to describe any probing that they did to um, you know, arrive at that conclusion. And if there's bracing, shoring required, then they've got to uh, uh, detail that as well. I okay, talked a little bit about assess assessment of adjoining structures. Um, yeah, the assessments aren't limited to the building that's going to be demolished. Um, you need to get familiar with potential hazards on the adjoining property. And again, any any uh, information about structures that re require require special attention. Um, you need to provide a structural evaluation of uh, adjacent and adjoining buildings. Any shared features. Party walls, staircases, common supporting structures. Um, that's information that you're going to need to prescribe a, a demolition sequence. Uh, 
Uh, these are some common errors and omissions, and I kind of mentioned them a little bit already, but um, you know, the structure is not accurately represented in the plans that we received. Uh, and the photos provided by the applicant, there are often items such as chimneys, um, other appurtenances that are in the photos that are not shown in the plans. Um, uh, oftentimes, subgrade spaces are not identified on the plans. Um, this is a picture of an excavator that was rolled because it wasn't made clear that there was a subgrade space there, and they drove it uh, drove it into the cellar or basement and rolled the excavator. Uh, oftentimes, party walls are not correctly ident identified or documented, or you know, damaged or collapsed areas are not described uh, on the plans. Uh, Matt Milner, I think, talked a little bit about that um, in the previous presentation about um, about that collapse, the building collapse. Um, there were areas inside the building that um, required shoring and were not identified uh, on the plans appropriately. Uh, and lastly, noggin walls um, and something that Tim Lynch discussed earlier, but th these are things that do not often show up in the plans and um, we usually don't find them until after the work has started because um, the building assessment was not performed. So we have uh, wood noggin wall, uh, party wall buildings. Um, there are three things that we're looking for uh, when doing the demolition here. We want to know the load capacity of the walls. Um, this brick infill was provided for fire separation. So when in the course of your demo, you expose one of these walls, um, you're going to have to maintain that fire separation for the remaining building. And uh, in addition to performing the remediation on this wall in the time from you, in the time from when you've uh, exposed this condition, you're going to have to provide uh, temporary weather protection um, at areas where there's you know, missing brick, uh, loose lane brick, exposed electrical conduit. Um, you're going to have to come up with a means to um, weather protect that while you're you're doing your demolition. Okay, now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, this is really the meat of the demolition plan section. Uh, plan development. So you've gathered all your information. Um, you've done your assessments. You've done your surveys. You've been to the site. Um, you've you've carefully documented the conditions. Uh, now we can start working on the plans. Uh, first thing, plans must be clear and easily understood by personnel at various levels of education. So the demo plan is a means and methods plan. It's a set of instructions uh, for the contractor to, to take down the building and it has to be well thought out and it has to be clear uh, graphically. So it's easily understood. Uh, BC 3306.5.1 talks about what's required for um, submittal documents for, for demolition work. And it says it shall be prepared by a registered design professional, which is an architect or an engineer, and it has to provide plan sections and details of the building to be demolished, any bracing or shoring to support demo operations and adjoining ground or structures as needed. Uh, so talk about mechanical demolition equipment. You have to provide a description of this, um, the scope of work, where the machines are gonna be positioned, uh, loads on the structure, um, and you have to describe compliance with 3306.9 of this section. Now, that's that's all the code says about what needs to be in a demo set. So to make things easier and to kind of clarify what it is that we look for um, in a good demolition set, this industry notice was issued in 2016. And it, I think it's four sheets, and it goes into kind of tries to kind of fill in the blanks of you know 
the minimum that we need. Uh, and we're going to kind of walk through each one of these. Uh, item one is a site plan. A site plan showing the property to be demolished, all adjoining property. Building stories and heights must be provided for, um, must be provided for both the building to be demolished as well as all adjoining buildings. Uh, important to note that it's not enough to just list the building stories. Uh, we need to know the, the heights, the relative heights to grade uh, and adjoining properties. Um, it's not enough information to just provide stories. We, we also need that elevation in feet. Um, site plan must provide horizontal offset dimensions of all adjacent structures in the property lines, uh, provide block and lot numbers. Basically, you're putting the building in context and you're telling us you know, where, where the hydrants are, where the sidewalk is, any, any adjoining properties. Um, and this is important because it's hard to identify what protection is required if you if you don't know these dimensions and you don't know um, if you don't have the site information. Uh, here's an example of a site plan. Uh, shows the property to be demolished, uh, adjoining property. In this case, this is an entire city block. Uh, it identifies the building height, stories, and feet. Um, at the property lines, address, block and lot. Uh, item two is um, the basic building structure. So this is all the information you gathered um, in your planning phase. So you've identified all the structure, materials, types, um, dimensions. Uh, you've defined the structural lateral system and You've done your research, you found the record drawings, and you've done your field surveys. So you've, you've provided your you know, existing conditions. Um, here's an example of a drawing. It's a section through. Uh, we'll get into later. It's got everything keyed in with a description of what, um, what the structure is, the thickness is. Um, here's our weak instructions. We can structure a statement again. We discussed this earlier, but um, this is item three on the list. It's got to be provided on the cover page so we don't have to uh, go searching for it. And you know, this is important information uh, that you need to know before any, any demo work uh, can begin. Uh, and the note at the bottom is also important. This should be um, assessment should be documented by a signed and sealed report. You know, this should be backed up by a report that was performed by or provided by the applicant of record. Uh, a couple of examples of weakened structures. Um, so here's one, the building is a weakened structure. According to the report, they referenced the report that they did. Uh, it has to be shored from inside, from basement to roof, according to the plans. Uh, below that is, is one where they're, they're stating that the structure is not weakened. Um, we've got a picture here of a partial floor collapse. Um, item four, fences and gates. So all construction fencing and gates, types, locations, dimensions must be clearly identified. This comes from Oh, section detail defense must be provided. Uh, this is work that at one time you could file your, your fence, um, your construction fence on the DM filing. Uh, you can no longer do that. It has to be done through uh, DOB now. It's a separate application, but you'll have to, for reference, provide a section detail of that on the demolition plan uh, because there are a number of different uh, fence types and uh, you need to make that clear uh, which ones are being used where. Uh, here's an example of a fence. As I said, 3307, this is all laid out. Protection of pedestrians, uh, eight foot high, solid. I need to identify the gate, gate types, whether they're sliding or swinging doors. 
Uh, these gates need to swing into areas not accessible to the public. So that's a big red flag if we get a plan set and the gate doors are swinging out into the sidewalk. Um, that's usually how we know we're in for, in for a bumpy ride. Uh, number five, demolition safety zone. Uh, safety zone must be shown and the method of defining that zone must be provided. Um, safety zone must be determined by the applicant of record based on the height of the building to be being demolished and the means and methods of demolition, the type of protection. And now, that's typically half the height of the building specified by the code that's for um, demolition, full demolition of a building where mechanical demolition equipment is used. So you have a 100 foot tall building, you're taking it down mechanically, you need a 50 foot safety zone. Now, the safety zone uh, is an area around the demolition um, where only workers can be present. So no one who's not a worker can be inside the safety zone. Um, that includes sidewalks. So if you're if you're using mechanical demo equipment, you may need to request um, a variance. I think the spirit of the code was was to this was to apply for uh, mechanical demolition from outside the building with you know like a, a large excavator. Now it's it's pretty common to do this type of work from inside the building with with uh, smaller equipment, and we do consider um, variance requests to do this, but it's kind of a case by case basis, and it depends, um, you know, what type of protection, what type of measures they're taking to uh, you know, provide additional protection for this kind of work, especially uh, when it's around the edge of the building. So we see things like this where there's a they provide a a supported scaffold with some some plywood decking. Um, they put limitations on uh, where the equipment can be located uh, and how far beyond the area of work that the protection, the additional protection, um, has to extend. But again, this is a what you're seeing here. These these drawings that is a variance uh, to the code. Uh, Okay, six, required protection. So this is all your uh, adjoining roof, yard, walkway, sidewalk protection. So this is BC 3307, pedestrian protection. It's uh, BC 3309, protection of adjoining properties. Some things like sidewalk sheds. Uh, these are required to protect all sidewalks, walkways, and pathways within the property line of the site and all public sidewalks that abut the property. Um, that be provided when sidewalk, walkway, or pathway is, is located below a scaffold, a mast climber, or a chute. And you've got to have the shed installed prior to installation of that equipment. Um, oh, and specific to demolition work, uh, you need a sidewalk shed when you're the structure to be demolished is higher than 25 feet. It's going to be fully demolished. Um, and there is no, there is no exception to this. I know for facade work, if the work, if there's like a half the height exception uh, that does not apply uh, to demolitions. I think that may be changing in uh, upcoming code revisions. Uh, 3309.10, protection of roofs. Um, so anytime you're you're demolishing a building above the roof of an adjoining building, you've got to protect their roof. This is a code uh, code specified, you know, standard roof protection, um, and you've got to protect. You've got to provide this protection for a horizontal distance of 20 feet from the edge of the building being demolished. Uh, horizontal safety netting is another protection measure. This is 3308.6.1.2 when you're doing demolition. Uh, this is not as common. We don't see that many 
uh, demolition applications for buildings that are you know, six stories or 75 feet in height. Uh, when we do see them, you either have to provide safety netting system uh, when there's an unenclosed perimeter, which there is in demolition, or there's a supported scaffold alternative where instead of providing the debris, um, the safety netting, you can uh, wrap the building in a supported scaffold with, with debris nets uh, per the requirements of this section. Uh, 3309.13 is protection of adjoining equipment and spaces. Uh, this talks about uh, protecting equipment on the adjoining property. Uh, there's a 20 foot, uh, 20 foot requirement similar to the roof protection requirement, but uh, this is specific to major buildings. Um, for anything less, it's kind of a, you know, depends on what is proposed or what the department uh, thinks is required. Um, but 20 feet is for, is you know, code mandated for any uh, demolition of any major building. And that's 10 stories or more, or, or more than 125 feet in height. Uh, protection of windows, anytime you've got an unenclosed perimeter, you need to protect uh, all windows on adjoining property that face the work and are 20 feet or less from that unenclosed perimeter. Uh, there's some exceptions there. Uh, minor alterations uh, doesn't apply here. Okay, 3309.15 is modifications and alternate methods. So we we see this a lot where people have difficulty providing the code required protection, their neighbor won't, won't agree to let them protect their roof. They're having trouble getting a license agreement um, and they wanna propose some other method of protection. Uh, this section of the code kind of lays out things that need to be addressed in these requests. And these come in, these, these are get, these submitted as a CCD1 variance requests. Um, they have to address this request content of 3309.15.1. Um, but in the end, it all boils down to can this protection that you're proposing be provided within your, your property? Because once you cross the property line, whether you're touching the building or not, if you're in their airspace, you need... Um, you need a license agreement with the adjoining property. Um, okay, under 3309.15, the department, uh, we may consider site-specific engineered enclosure systems that meet the following requirements. So if you're submitting um, an alternate protection system under 3309.15, uh, these are some requirements that for systems that you know, will be considered by the department, but these all have to be addressed um, in order to be able to use that that type of system. And uh, if approved, you know this can be um, this can be used in lieu of roof protection, window protection, adjoining property protection. But um, there are some requirements to be met. Um, it has to be designed by a, a registered design professional to be specific to the site, uh, meet all temporary loading requirements, uh, including wind, wind load uh, per chapter 16, uh, has to be acceptable to the commissioner or, or the building department, has to be positioned ex exterior to the building and cover all areas along the exposure where exterior work is occurring or openings in the exterior are present. The uh, lowest level of the system has to meet design loads for a sidewalk shed. Um, the gap between the the, uh, the lowest level or the openings in the exterior of the building along the exposure have to be tight to the face of the building. Uh, gap can't exceed one inch along the face of the building. 
um, have to cover the vertical surfaces of the system by uh, wire screen, and there are some specifications for that. Um, there are some inspection requirements. You need to provide like an inspection schedule or list of inspections uh, that will be performed. And then you have to provide a controlled access zone or other other measures um, for the installation or uh, reinstallation or removal of, of this system. So you have to come up with a way that you're going to protect the adjoining property while you install this uh, if that's necessary. Okay, supported scaffolds. We talked about this earlier. Uh, these have to be shown on, on demolition plans. Here's an example. Um, you know, it may be used as a work platform. It might be part of a protection system. Um, has to be all identified on the plan. Any encroachments? So you have to enclose your site with a construction fence per 3307. Um, a lot of times you can't, you know, with a zero lot line building, or, you know, you may have to provide your fence or some other protection on an adjoining property. Uh, 3309 deals with license agreements. Uh, we require you to put a note on the plan stating that, you know, installation of a fence on the adjoining property, you know, subject to approval and the cons consent of the adjoining property owner. So uh, when you see this approved on your demo plan, uh, DOB is not authorizing you to install the fence on the neighbor's property. That's, you know, something you need to work out with a neighbor, uh, just as, you know, we're not approving uh, any street closures or, you know, placing your your fence you know, beyond three feet onto the sidewalk that requires DOT approval. Uh, the department's not authorizing you to, to install that. You've still got to get the required necessary approvals and uh, license agreement with a neighbor. Okay, now we get to the demolition sequence. Uh, this is at the heart of every demolition plan set is the demo sequence. Um, and the best demolition plan sets, this is my experience, don't, they don't start with a demo sequence, but they arrive at it. So um, once you've, you've um, established structure, you know, you're aware of any, um, any areas that need, need shoring, you, like you're familiar with the building, you know what you're working with, um, then you can and start your, your demolition sequence. You can start to prescribe how the building should be, should be demolished. Uh, it, it helps, I think, if you are, if you have access to uh, a contractor or you know what type of equipment they have or have access to, or, you know, you get their, their input as to how, how best to take this down then you can start to um, start to provide that information, uh, prescribe you know, the, the direction um, that this is gonna, gonna proceed in. Uh, oh, I'll go back. Um, and generally demolition is, a, is, is top down, unless, uh, unless you're in Japan and they do things like this where they take the building down from the bottom or from the middle. Uh, I've never seen this in New York. Uh, I would love to see it. If anyone wants to try that, I would love to see the demo plans for it. Uh, I'm not sure if it's code compliant, but um, okay. Building code 3306 talks about demolition sequence. Uh, it tells you that uh, any structural member that's being dismembered shall not support any, any load other than its own weight. So no wall, chimney, or other structural part shall be left in such condition that it may collapse or be toppled by wind, vibration, or other cause. Um, the method of removal of any structural member shall not destabilize remaining members. Uh, all handling and movement of material and debris shall be controlled such that it will not develop unaccounted impact loads on the structure. And then it goes on to talk about structural steel, reinforced concrete, heavy timber buildings. Um, special requirements for that, masonry buildings, 
uh, with wood floors. Uh, Matt Milner talked about that earlier. Uh, so if you missed his presentation, I recommend that you go back um, and revisit that. Okay, we talked about uh, demolition sequence have to it has to be phased and has to be uh, each each phase has to be and each step of the phase has to be identified with a, a number or letter designation. So here you can see that for this phase phase D, um, they got everything keyed keyed in. Every member is identified or every step is identified. There's a uh, there's an arrow. Uh, indicating the direction to proceed in. Uh, here's another one with steps. This is talking about uh, second floor removal. Um, they're doing the work from below on a baker scaffold. Uh, they tell you when to remove the deck, the wood stair. Uh, they've got instructions for um, removal of joists of the party wall. And they've got um, some party wall remediation and uh, anchor installation referenced here. Uh, and instructions for parging and, and weatherproofing and references to those uh, relevant details. Here's a here's an anchorage detail for, um, for a party wall. This is like the level of detail that we expect. Uh, we see some really poor, uh, poor details for this type of work. Um, this is very specific about uh, types of fasteners, um, all, all the types of equipment to be used. Also, in the demolition sequence, there should be like a, um, a prior to demo sequence in which all the hazards are removed. Those hazards are are discussed in uh, thirty three oh six point nine point eight. Um, combustible content has to be removed before demo demo begins. Asbestos containing material has to be removed, all glass, and steam and fuel equipment, so pipes, tanks, boilers, um, those all have to be removed prior to structural demo. Uh, here we've got a couple of demo sequences. Uh, preparation work notes on the left talks about the installation of the fence, um, keeping egress, means of egress. Um, cleared of any obstructions or debris, uh, removal of fixtures, cabinets, doors, uh, asbestos abatement, all the things that have to be performed before the demolition work can start. And then the first phase of the, the demo sequence being the uh, roof removal, steps uh, one through, through 12. Uh, common errors and emissions. Um, this is kind of generally Deficient demolition sequence is, you know, one of the biggest problems we, we see with um, with demolition plans. Just, um, just not enough detail to to describe existing structure, um, entire demolition phases described in one one sentence. So this is the entire demolition of a of a one story building. Step one was uh, existing roof wood joists to be demolished manually. And then they're using a brock to demolish the building from south to north. Uh, they don't tell you what the uh, what the, the walls are made of. They don't tell you the thickness. Uh, debris removal is, is a one line. Bobcat will be used to cart debris to a roll off container. And uh, I don't know why step four was included. It's, it's flagman will be present during loadout. Not really relevant to the to the sequence. Neither are the fire extinguishers. Um, here's the plan. Keynotes are, are letters. I don't know if those are supposed to reference um, the steps in the sequence, but you know all that should be keyed in. The one we saw earlier was a better example. Uh, they're not all this bad. This is one of the one of the worst, but they're all like when we see problems with the demo plan set and the sequence. It's usually on on this type of level. It's just not not enough information provided, not enough detail. Uh, shoring and bracing, item ten. Uh, 
short embracing other stabilization measures that need to take place prior to demo uh, in a clear and detailed sequence of this work must be provided. Uh, so you've got to, if there's any short embracing that has to be provided before you can go into the building to provide or to begin the demo, then you've got to uh, provide a sequence for that and you've got to indicate where that's that's going to happen. You've got to provide details for that showing embracing. Uh, here's a section through a building with a note, install provisional shoring from a uh, basement to the roof. Uh, it's got minimum capacity for that. It's, and it indicates that this has to be installed before uh, demolition starts. There's a reference to some details for that. Um, there's a note here and a reference for for a shoot. We'll get to that shortly. Here's some more notes about shoring and bracing. Maybe you need to, if you're planning to put equipment or machines on the floor, you might need to um, you might need to brace those floors. Um, in this case, this was a situation where they had a debris container. They provided shoring for that. They've got notes, specific notes about the shoring and what's required, uh, where it's located. Uh, debris removal is important to note. It's item 11. Uh, you have to provide a means and methods of, of debris removal from the point of demolition to the public roadway. So uh, you're working on the roof. How does that how does that debris get down eventually to the container? Um, is there a chute involved? Is there an opening in the floor? Is a chute required? Um, uh, it mentions structures must be lowered in a controlled manner means and methods to provide or to ensure their safe removal shall be provided. Uh, uncontrolled dropping of material is forbidden. Um, you're not allowed to cut cut beams and drop them on the floor. Uh, everything's gotta be uh, lashed and, uh, and lowered in a controlled manner. Okay, shoots 3303.5 talks about shoots. Um, design requirements, uh, when a permit is required. Uh, here's a detail for a shoot opening in a floor. So, you know, the code gets into requirements for, you know, when it has to be enclosed, when, when it doesn't have to be enclosed. Um, and there's some exceptions to the permit requirements uh, noted below here. Uh, we went into mechanical demo demo equipment earlier. So all the non handheld equipment, all the machines have to be indicated on the plan and it's important to note the, the gross weight of the equipment. Uh, it notes here the applicant of record may designate the use of a specific piece of equipment, but allow for alternates within the same weight range and type. So maybe you don't know the exact make and model that the contractor is going to be using. Um, you can indicate on the plan, uh, sort of like a, a typical approval uh, that's maybe subject to um, subject to the applicant of record for uh, any changes, or you can give like a list of a list of alternates. Uh, if you're going to be using a crane, which is not common, you're going to have to get. Uh, Crane's approval, if that's required, you have to um, you have to identify that on the on the demolition plans, and you have to provide calculations uh, demonstrating that it's the capacity of the floor can support the mechanical equipment, um, and any conditions imposed on on it uh, or position on the floor. So this is all subject to the approval of the commissioner. So we're looking for for these kind of like cut sheets on on the plans that indicate um, the dimensions of the equipment, the weight. Uh, we'd like to see if the working range. So if you're use, you're proposing to remove you know, part of a floor or a wall, uh, you know we like to look to see that. Equipment's capable of doing what it's uh, being prescribed to use for. Uh, it's got it's the operating capacity of the machine, travel speed, 
here's a plan where they had to they had to provide shoring for the floor and they got notes about uh, allowable oper operational area for the for the equipment and how they're going to indicate that on the site. So there's some any uh, any specific guidelines on the limitation of the machine's use needs to be needs to be uh, identified on the plan. So travel area is important. Any restrictions on that? Uh, specific distance from the building line or uh, other machines or equipment. Uh, they need to identify any areas with inadequate support, limited headroom, uh, any controlled access zones. So, um, you know, where can workers be when you're chopping the slab out on a floor? You might need to identify controlled access zones um, below and the other areas uh, on the working deck. Uh, and this is a nice. Uh, a nice list of you know restrictions for uh, equipment use. See, they identify here the maximum number of mini excavators, rocks, skid steers, scissor lift permitted on any floor of the building is 12. Minimum spacing between machines is one bay or 20 feet, whichever is greater. Uh, they tell you when chopping concrete, machines and personnel on the floors below shall not travel or occupy the area directly beneath the machine. These are controlled access zones. So this is a pretty good, good list of uh, you know, equipment operation limitations. Number 13 is egress. Uh, everyone's got to identify uh, building egress on the plan and you've got to uh, maintain that egress uh, during the demolition. 3303.11 uh, talks about stairs during construction or demolition. So, see item two talks about stairs in a building undergoing a full demolition shall comply with section 3306.9.9. Um, that tells you that all enclosed vertical shafts and stairs shall be maintained and closed at all floors except the uppermost floor being demolished. And all work on the uppermost floor shall be completed before the stair and shaft enclosures on the floor below are disturbed. So, you've got to maintain the stair. Um, as as you uh, perform the demo, uh, FDNY hoist. Like I said, this is it's more rare to uh, we don't receive that many applications for demolition of buildings that would require uh, FDNY hoist. But um, when we do have one, they have to demonstrate compliance with this section. Uh, Exception number two usually applies where floors that are located within a vertical distance of seven stories or 75 feet or less from the working deck. Uh, elevator hoist is not required uh, during a demolition. So that just says your hoist has to get you within seven stories or 75 feet from the working deck. This is an example of a job where they did have a hoist on. Uh, on a, on a demolition uh, describes the this will be the working deck here this is the lower floors there's an exclusion zone here um, like I said not not often a requirement for for a demolition number 15 water supply you've got to indicate on the plan uh, the source of the water that you're using for uh, dust mitigation uh, if you're using a hydrant it requires a DP permit uh, you need to keep the permit on site at all times. You need to identify the location uh, of the hydrants. Uh, this is an example where they talk about their debris removal, dust control, uh, you know, dust producing operations shall be wetted down. There's a note here. Um, they tell you where the where the hydrant is located that they're going to be using. Uh, 16 fire detection and suppression. Um, so in addition to identifying the location of the extinguishers, uh, fire watch, hot works, et cetera, uh, you've also got to maintain your sprinklers during demolition. Uh, I see we're already going over time, so I'm gonna try to 
try to go through here and maybe you can you can catch up with this um, on your own time, but this I'm just going to touch on these briefly. You've got to maintain the sprinklers during your demolition. Uh, you've got to maintain your standpipe as a dry system during a full demo. And you've got to uh, provide a air pressurized alarm system for the, the dry standpipe. Um, 17, adjoining walls. You've got to provide a method for uh, adjoining wall remediation. Uh, lot line walls must be shown, new weatherproofing, repair, floor to wall anchorage. Um, this is a detail showing uh, like parge coating, thorough seal. 3309.8 talks about adjoining walls. And we talked earlier about the, um, the noggin wall construction, but that's a special one. Um, but you've got to maintain the structural integrity of these walls. This talks about party wall remediation. Weatherproof integrity. So these are things that you have to, um, anytime you expose these conditions, uh, you have to perform this, this remediation per these requirements um, of adjoining property protection. Uh, here's another nice detail for um, party wall tieback installation. Uh, it's got notes for waterproofing. Uh, number 18 is end of demolition. So the end of demolition conditions have to be clearly illustrated in plan and section, including any remaining foundation elements, uh, means of stabilizing those elements and the adjoining property, um, either complete backfill, berms, shoring and bracing. You need a detailed section to show uh, the elevation of the footing in the building being demolished as it relates to the adjoining property footing. Uh, this detail is required to determine if the foundation of the building being demolished is providing support, vertical or lateral, for the adjoining property that may require shoring. Uh, if so, shoring, underpinning, berming, backfill, etc., must be provided on the DM application or related all to referenced on the DM application. Um, if you're going to leave foundation elements in place, you've got to um, follow the requirements of the industry notice or demolition filings, uh, waiver of backfill and or foundation removal. So 3306.10 talks about removal of foundations and slabs. It's got certain conditions for that. Uh, basically, everything has to be removed or if you're leaving a cellar slab, you've got to You've got to crack it to allow for drainage. Uh, this is the notice for waiver of backfill and foundation removal. And this used to be a CCD1 request. I think there were so many of them that they issued this notice. So now it can be, uh, this can be included with a demo plan submission, provided you include all these, these notes. So there, were, there are three situations, three different waiver situations. One, you want to waive full backfill only, so you've removed the foundation and slab. You just don't want to backfill the site. You address these notes, um, so you have to include a, a waiver request. Number one, you have to provide justification for waiving complete backfill. Uh, and note that if earthwork for new development will not begin within three months of completion of demo operations, periodic inspections by an engineer are required and must be included uh, with the plan and that's from 3303.13.3. Then you have to provide uh, plans, plan view, section view, so you need a long longitudinal section, you need a cross section, you've got to indicate uh, the site conditions at the end of demo. Um, and for the next, the next two, foundation and slab removal, you have, you have to indicate what structure is left uh, in plan and section, how deep, like what's the floating depth? Um, you know, will it be backfilled? Are you going to waive requesting a waiver of backfill? Um, you have to indicate in your waiver request that all the conditions of this waiver request are are satisfied, and you have to indicate that the owner 
property owner will be provided with these plans showing the site conditions at completion of demo um, so they can be incorporated into SOE design for a, for a new development. Um, and, so it can, and so the demo can be signed off. Uh, here's, a, here's a waiver request with the related section. And completion of demo operations. This is um, all work required for structural stability. This is what it's going to look like when you're done. Everything's charged. Uh, tiebacks are installed. Uh, number 19 was special inspections. Those all have to be identified on the plan. That comes from administrative code. Uh, so typically it's going to be a mechanical demolition or structural stability. We're going to be looking to make sure that this matches what was provided on the TR1. Um, and that's it. Uh, all right. Though. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now we're gonna we're gonna try to answer a couple questions. Um, anything we can't get to, as I said in the beginning, we will have. Uh, there will be an FAQ um, attached to this presentation when it gets posted to the website. So, okay. So question, in an instance where the neighbor wall has no outer envelope and relied on the backside of your wall being removed, does it still remain the responsibility to the person causing demo even though the neighbor did not adequately build a proper exterior wall. Um, we see this occasionally. Um, it's difficult to answer without, without seeing it in context, but I think what you're saying is your, your building wall was used by the neighbor uh, in their construction I think the way that was resolved was um, you have to come to some kind of agreement with the neighbor where either you they have to either you have to leave that wall or you have to provide um, you have to provide some sort of uh, where the neighbor has to has to build build the wall on their property, but um, it's, we have seen this a couple of times before. There are ways around it. Um, I'll see if we can come up with a better answer uh, for the FAQ. Um, I'll revisit that. Um, okay, next question. Okay, next question. How about removal of utilities? Um, I, that was under hazards to be removed, I believe. So all utilities have to be have to be cut and capped before you can start your, your demolition. Uh, we're not really looking at it so much at the plan level. That's gonna be something that you need to uh, get your permit. You will have to issue uh, cutoff letters uh, to the permit office to to, to get your permit, but it's not something that you know has to be indicated on the plans, uh, except for as it pertains to the hazards to be removed. Um, okay, next question. Well, that was the last one, or one more? All right, one more. Can you? All right. The last question, can you remove and replace a damaged party wall on the roof of the properties? Do you need neighbor's consent? Uh, I believe you need the neighbor's consent anytime you're, you're, if you're talking about the entire party wall and not just your, your half of the party wall, um, you're gonna need, you're gonna need to discuss that with, a, with the uh, adjoining property owner. Well, anytime you, you're across the property line. Okay, well that that concludes the presentation. Um, thanks everyone for for joining us. Sorry, we went a little bit over. Um, look for this to be posted.
to the website in the next couple of weeks, and you know we'll do our best to uh, answer any questions that we didn't get to. Okay, thanks.